We're going to cover the things they don't want you to know on today's A Named Real Estate Podcast. Hi there, my name is Charles Ray Dawson. I'm the Associate Broker Residential Sales Manager of ProStar Realty. This is the Unnamed Real Estate Podcast, Episode 195, Take 2. And I say take two because I have recorded everything. It was about 30 minutes worth of talking and then went to encode it so I could upload it. And that file was corrupted. And so all my hard work is gone. But don't worry, because I love you guys. I'm going to do it all over again. There was at one point I was like seriously thinking, okay, we'll just do this live and just played around with the YouTube and went, I can record live, but I can't show you all these great graphics I came up with live. And where's the fun in that? Because I know, honestly, I know most of you guys don't even look at the screen. You're just sitting there listening to my dulcet tones in the background. And, but sometimes the visuals help. So from the top. Last week was part one of housing affordability and how the two campaigns proposed to address housing affordability. So, a couple things we need to know to start. One, this year is the worst year in real estate since 1995 for actual volume of sales. We also have one out of, uh, I would say half, no, five out of ten, half of all renters are saying that they are, their household cost burden is excessive because of their rent. And this is from, from the renter's side. So, half the renters out there are having a hard time. We've had the slowest market since 1995. The number one issue that most voters state when they are polled, what is your biggest issue this year for the election, is the economy. In the great words of James Carville, it's the economy, stupid. Now, because of the natures of campaigns and the nature of modern voter practices, most candidates go and they try to motivate distinct segments of the population that they know will vote for them on that issue. And they will make that issue a big, big thing in their campaign. And if they can differentiate a very specific block of voters by promoting something without losing too much of their other voters, they will start pushing that over and over again, which is why you hear, honestly, some, some candidates just keep going off about silly stuff. You know, it's like, why are we still talking about this? Didn't the Supreme Court say that this wasn't a federal issue anymore? But it gets voters to the polls and it more importantly, it gets money to campaigns. So a lot of times things get ignored by the politicians, but you think to yourself, but wait, I'm, if the majority of voters care about this issue, why aren't the politicians doing anything about it? Well, because we have really suck politicians, all right? Now I'm going to try to not editorialize during the course of this whole thing, but you know, my first recording, I was bright, cheerful, happy, wrapping the whole thing up. And after two and a half hours of playing with the computer stuff and one really dumb investor type person who called me up and kept trying to convince me I had a listing I didn't have. And as soon as she realized it wasn't, she wasn't talking to the wrong guy, just hung up on me. Yeah, I'm a little cranky now. So let's go back. House, uh, housing affordability. All right. Uh, majority of voters. All right. I'm not saying a plurality of voters, but a majority of voters say that the economy is their number one issue. And when you boil down and you break down the economy, all right, the number one issue of people in the economy is housing affordability, especially with the younger generations. We're looking at the millennials and we're looking at the Zoomers, all right, the have nots. All right. And so one could say this, this might be a campaign about the haves and the haves nots, right? I have my house and so I'm going to worry about other things. All right. I don't have a house and I really worry about that and I don't care about your other things. All right. So when you're looking at a tranche of the population who is very interested in housing affordability, that's when the real estate agents should be stepping up and explaining you how these policies are going to affect you, the consumer. Now, I did oh, a lot of research on this, and I've been going around through the different um, other real estate webs, uh, YouTube channels and whatnot, and 
they really aren't addressing it the way I'd like to see it addressed. There are several very political channels. There are several uh, yada, da, da, da. And this is why you need to buy now. Because, you know, if Canada Day gets in here, the economy is going to be just absolutely running in the toilet. It will be total anarchy. I mean, you need to buy yourself a house so you can forward up with your um, food and canned goods and firearms and get ready for the end of civilization. But if you vote for candidate B, well, then it's going to be sunshine and jelly beans. All right. So that kind of stuff. Uh, several investor channels that I was actually looking forward to listening to was they're just a little biased even by my standards. Right. So what I did is I record, I printed up a bunch of different articles, read a bunch of articles, highlighted it, and I broke it down to. We're going to apply this all to my three-legged stool of home affordability. And then after we go through the three-legged stool of home affordability, which I'm going to remind you of, we're going to talk about their policies and which leg of that stool is impacted by it. I'm going to try to be neutral here, but hey, it's me. Now, the other thing we're going to be doing this whole thing is I am going to be recording in little, little clips, splicing them all together. That way, if I lose or can't update or can't encode the file, I'm not going to lose a whole 30 minutes like I did last time. So around the top, housing affordability. Last week we discussed what is meant by housing affordability. It measures the degree with to, in which a typical family can afford the monthly mortgage payments on a typical home. This is the Fed definition of this, right? And now it breaks in between cost to home, how much can you afford? Right. I break it down to what I call the three-legged stool. Right, And this is cost of the home or housing prices, the interest rates, and other costs involved in getting a home. Right, So we're separating that, that um, the monthly mortgage paying out into two separate categories. And then we have the household income underneath. Right. So house prices interest now remember on interest rates and insurance all right that is sort of a catch all for all other costs one of my uh, my viewers the other day uh, my last episode mentioned the upkeep of the home all right this also is, is included in the interest rates and insurance and all of the other costs right and then finally household income now from the various different news sources i used all right. One of them in the Epoch Times did and had an actual really great chart of all the different policy decisions and ideas that the two candidates had. Right. And I narrowed down on just what they were talking about housing. Now, this is not a complete and we'll cover that later on. But so far, according to these guys, all right, Trump's ideas for the housing is he's promising to lower mortgage rates by bringing inflation down. He's supporting opening limited portions of federal land for new home construction. And he would increase home ownership through tax incentives and support for first-time home buyers. And he would cut any unnecessarily regulations that increase housing costs. Harris, on the other side, her ideas are she promises to build 3 million new homes in four years to address the national housing sh shortage. She suggests cutting regulatory red tape to increase the speed of home construction. She calls on Congress to pass legislation to outlaw price fixing by corporate landlords. Which she would provide first-time home buyers with a $25,000 subsidy on their down payments, and she pledges to offer tax incentives for home builders who construct affordable homes for first-time buyers. So you will see a lot of comparisons between the two, and a lot of times both candidates are saying the same thing and are going to implement the same ideas. Right. Starting at the top with house prices. All right. As we remember last week, house prices are driven by supply and demand. One of the issues with supply and demand is construction costs. Now, in this particular case, if you see it in that orange or that sort of tan color, that is the Trump campaign's policy to, uh, on these things. The Harris campaign, we're using blue. I already used red, so I cannot use red for the Republican side as much as I'd like to, but I don't think anybody's going to give me a hard time for using orange for Trump. All right. Now, if you see something in orange, that means that it's a Trump idea. All right. So as to address supply and demand, and this is actually to reduce demand. All right. He states that he's going to lower the rate of immigration and also deport illegal aliens, thus reducing the demand on housing. So it has been pointed out by um, by the Cato Institute that if you remo re reduce the demand or if you reduce the immigration, all right, you are going to remove 
one of the one third of construction workers here in America who are immigrants. And by reducing one third of labor supply, you're going to drive up costs. That was their concern with this. Right? Now, we are short anywhere between two and a half and four million homes in America. And we have estimated anywhere between 10 million and 20 million illegal aliens in the country. Now, so can you say, I don't need to, I don't need to build 300 houses or 3 million houses. I just need to get rid of 10 million illegal aliens. That's a really hard call to make. All right. So is that going to have an impact? Don't know. That's what, how he, uh, he intends on reducing the demand on housing. The, Harris campaign has no policy that I could find that said anything how she was going to reduce demand. Right? She does want to increase supply, right? and part of that will have to do is the you know is her um, regular getting rid of regulations. All right, now let's start at top. Fed lands both policy both candidates have said that they are going to release federal owned land for housing. This has been done to a small extent in Clark County in Nevada. And in other various areas throughout the country, they want to maximize this and take this this show on the road. Um, the Clark County project released about 200 houses, uh, created land for an extra 200 houses, and they're actually about 45,000 behind of where they need to be. All right, so it's almost a drop in the bucket, but it's still part of the effect that they want to have. Right. Other thing that they both stated they want to do is they wanted to get rid of zoning issues. Now remember, zoning issues are generally driven by localities. They are the city, the county, and the state create those zoning restrictions. There's not a lot of federal zoning restrictions out there. So that is a question about whether or not these either one candidate can have any effect by getting rid of zoning. Now the Harris campaign, um, some of these articles were stating that they will provide money to municipalities if they change their zoning re um, restrictions on building housing. It's an interesting idea. Um, a lot of times the federal government influences state, city, state, county areas by attaching strings to the money. It's like, you do this, you'll get more money. You don't do this, we'll take money away. Anybody who remembers living anywhere near Wyoming when um, the feds forced Wyoming to up the drinking age all right, and tied it into federal highway funds understands what I'm talking about. Right? Other thing we have, building regulations. Um, wow, that's that one's going to be really hard. Okay, uh, either one of them said there's there's going to be regulations out there that keep people from building. We're going to limit or, or ease restrictions on these regulations. And that's another thing. We'll see it when we see it. The Trump campaign also several times as when they are asked this directly, constantly comes back to energy prices. Right? A lot of the construction costs, all right, can be influenced by reducing energy costs. Right. It's a pass-through cause to you, the consumer, the homeowner. Right. To use an example, if I'm going to cut down a tree with a chainsaw, i got to buy gasoline and 2-1 oil. Right. That stuff comes out of the ground. If it costs less, it costs me less to use the chainsaw. It then costs me less to put it on the truck to take it to the sawmill. The sawmill, who's going to be running, they don't use the old steam from the waste of wood anymore, Okay, who's probably going to be running electric, on electric, Right. If I have lower energy costs, it's going to be cheaper to cut boards. It's going to be cheaper to move those boards to Home Depot. It's going to be cheaper to put those boards together and make a house. Right. That's part of what their uh, plans are to reduce construction costs on home prices. So one thing I really wanted to go in a really quick deep dive on is this releasing fed lands. As you can see, <clears throat> when we go to this great map I found on a government website, this is the federal lands all right, throughout the country. All right? And you can see it's monitored by multiple different government organizations. Right? We have the Bureau of Indian Affairs. This is this sort of pink reddish color. I don't know exactly what we'd call that. All right? Then you have the Bureau of Land Management. They are in the yellows. Okay, we have uh, Bureau of Reclamation. 
in dark purple. Don't see anything. Probably have to blow that up a lot. Um, Department of Defense is in blue. That's our big Air Force ranges. All right. Look, Twilla Army Depot. Um, you could probably have Pendleton in there. All right. So there, that's your Department of Defense. You have Fish and Wildlife in orange. This little area right there. Uh, Forest Service is the light green. National Park Service is the darker green. All right. Tennessee Valley Authority did not realize they were still a thing right there. And other agencies. So both part, you know, both candidacies have said we are going to have, see if there's any federal land we can get rid of. So as you can tell, Iowa is not going to be impacted in that at all. all right, according to this, the federal government owns none of Iowa. Right? Same thing over here with like Connecticut, Massachusetts, Virginia, National Forest, Parkland, South Carolina. And you might be asking yourself if you live out here in the, oh, Maine, maybe a little bit right there. All right. Why is it that the Western states seem to be owned by the federal government? I mean, literally, the federal government owns more of Nevada than the citizens in the state of Nevada. Arizona, probably pretty much the same. Utah. What's going on with all this? Well, a little bit of history right here. During the Civil War, the government was operating with reduced amount of representation because half the congressmen moved south to fight the war. Um, at that point, Nevada became a state during the middle of the Civil War. They decided they were not going to do the bill to allocate the federal lands of the territory of Nevada to the state of Nevada until after the war was over. Once the war got over, they never got around to it because they sort of liked having Nevada being federal property because all the grazing and all the mining rights and everything, all right, okay, those payment rights went to the federal government and not to the state of Nevada. And they pretty much kept doing that as they added all the extra states on, all right? You can see Cal California here was a state at the time, but they only allocated this much because nobody wanted this desert. Right? That's why we put in so many military bases out there. And this is sort of a continuing thing we saw. Every once in a while, some Western state politicians will start talking about returning, making Nevada, Nevada again, or at all. And it usually gets shot down by a bunch of Congress critters over here telling a bunch of Congress or people over here, this would be so much better if this was working right, how they're going to live their lives, right? I'm from the West, right? This has always been a sore subject for me. Um, there was a bunch of Western congressmen got together and they're like trying to intimate domain some some piece of property in New Jersey. All right, just to get back at the New Jersey congressman who was the promoter or whatever of some screw the West bill. Anyways, just petty politics. You got to love it, boys and girls. All right, so let's get back to releasing some of this land. So this is a policy that could help people out here in the West, especially the Southwest, which is a growing, you know, population dense area. People are leaving California. They're leaving Chicago. They're leaving New York, right? They're moving south. They're moving to the southwest, right? How could we do this? Now, if you notice Arizona right here, okay, and this is about where America, you know, Phoenix is right here, right? We have some issues with that concept because if you notice, we don't have a lot of federal land around us. This land here and here, now let me pull, right, is Indian Reservation. And I know what you're thinking. And stop it. Bad white person. We're not taking any more Indian land. Don't do that. All right? That's theirs. Now, what's, go but what's going on is here in Phoenix, all right, we have a reservation out to the east of us. If you fly into Phoenix, Phoenix Sky Harbor, and you're on the right side of the plane, and you're landing from east to west, and you look out the, the window as you're on approach, all right, you will notice desert, 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 line housing all right and it's like flipping a switch right the desert you see is is the reservation same thing with the south side of here all right those line, reservation lands they're not getting developed into housing and into strip malls or anything else right 
But what we do have is we do have little isolated bits that are owned by the federal government. All right. This map right here, also found on the federal, you can go to frppmap.gsa.gov slash frppmap slash, all right, we'll get you this. Every little dot denotes a parcel of federal owned property. If you notice, we have these weird little lines, sort of like blood vessels. These are ditches and canals. And then a lot of those little red lines are the little monitoring stations, separate little parcels along the canal owned by the federal government to monitor the water, right? And we have a bunch of other little dots in here. And I sat here and clicked around at a lot of these dots. A lot of these dots are leased office buildings. Uh, some of these dots are, you know, just general. They lease an office space to put the VA administrative offices in. That's a dot, all right? Department of Interior has an office down here. That's a dot. So I clicked on a few of these dots and really did not find any land that could turn into a really good housing development, except for this one. This one really intrigues me. All right. This property is out here. Okay. And our cross streets here is about 80th street, power road and Adobe street. All right. Next to the red mountain park, multi-use area. All right. This is 513.6 acres of land. It is owned by the Department of the Interior. All right. Its use is reclamation and irrigation. Legal interest indicator is withdrawn land. Don't know what that means. All right. And the status indicator is it's meeting a current mission need. You know, using basic development math, we could put on 513 acres, 3,000 homes. That is 3,600 or 6,000 square foot lots. So we're talking those little dense pack ones, right? But that's a three, two, do them on a, do them as a two story. That would be first time home buyer houses, starter homes. And we could drop those on the east side of, east side of the valley right there with that 513.6 acres. And we definitely make it affordable if the land was granted free from the federal government to the state of Arizona to do whatever with, to contract it out to one of the builders to build us, give us 3,000 homes on that. Right. And one of the interesting things that, um, that we do when we, we talk about uh, housing and, and whatnot is every new build house is two full-time jobs for one year. Every house you build keeps two people employed for an entire year, right? Now, of course, because every that job gets broken down. It's not just two people building one house. Or it takes them a year to do it. It gets broken down among the specialties or so. But that's the rule of thumb that we use to calculate that. So that is potential 6,000 jobs, right, on that project right there to complete those homes. Right? That would be a serious boom, although we do have construction costs because we have labor shortage when it comes to the skilled trades. So really interesting little concept to how we do that. Um, but this is an example of how that federal land purchase would benefit Maricopa County in this particular case, Mesa, you know, and first time home buyers. All right. Quite nicely. So let's see how that one goes out. Next category. Now we've dealt with home prices itself. We're going to talk about the home costs, right? Interest rates. All right. Now interest rates itself. Okay. The as near as I can tell, the Harris campaign does not in, address interest rates at all. Right? Trump campaign says he's going to drive down interest rates by reducing inflation. All right. Now I should put, a, I should have said this earlier, um, but I am only talking about policies and proposals of the two different candidacies if they say the magic words and this is how i will impact housing affordability i could go on for hours about all the various little policies they float out there and how it's going to affect this and how it's going to affect this and da 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 da, da. and the secondary and the downstream and the tertiary effects will be this all right i'm specifically saying if somebody's asked him a question how do you address housing affordability? If they say this and this is how it's tied in, I'm trying to include it on this thing. 
if I see them talking about something that I think is going to impact housing affordability, but they have not linked the two, the candidate all right, has not linked the two concepts together, I'm not mentioning it in the scope of this video. All right. So probably should have said that up at the top, but in fact, I did the first recording I did on this. All right. All right. So in this particular case, he's, you know, the Trump campaign is saying that they are going to drive down the interest rates. All right. By reducing overall inflation. And that will impact you, the consumer trying to buy a house. All right. We also stated that insurance is one of those costs on here. There is no, the, in neither case did has any candidate in, that I can discover said, I'm going to reduce your insurance costs on your house by doing X. I can say then that there are some things implied, all right, but they have not specifically stated that. They have mentioned they're going to deal with your closing costs. The Harris campaign is saying she's going to give every first time home buyer a $25,000 grant to purchase a house. I don't know what what costs those funds can be allocated to, right? It's very vague on specifics, like any good candidate, you know, right? Say it's give them the headlines, not the specifics. You're going to piss people off with these specifics, right? There's also a secondary thing along those lines that if you are a person who is a first time home buyer and your parents did not own their own home, so you're a generational first time home buyer, you're going to get even more than 25,000. Now, a little editorial on this. I'm concerned because a lot of times the way the federal government does stuff like this is like, oh, you're a first time home buyer if you haven't had a house in five years. All right. Literally, that's how some of these first time home buyer programs are written. First time home buyer or you haven't had a house in five years because you lost it in the crash or whatever like that. So, you know, it could. Well, my parents are dead. Oh, OK, well. You're the first one. You're the first generation to own a house because we don't count any previous dead generations. Okay. So anyways, also no conversation where the 25,000 is coming from, but hey, it's government money. You just make the print and go work. All right. And that is part of what they're going to do to cover closing costs and how to get into it. All right. Also the tax benefits and tax breaks for first time um, home buyers. Both candidates have stated there will be tax benefits for owning a house or buying a house. So that's what, how they're planning on bringing down these costs. Last one on my free link to it is the actual household income itself, right? Um, this category, like I said, if they haven't tied it in directly, I'm not mentioning it here, all right? Remember, supply and demand of labor, family structure, multi-generational housing and stuff like that, all right? Nothing for costs, all right, except for the Harris campaign and her outlaw price fixing. Uh, could not find any details on what she means by outlaw price fixing, all right, and who's going to be impacted by that, all right. But she stated she's going to re reduce the cost of you, the individual consumer, by outlawing price fixing, all right, so you can apparently rent a more expensive property. Not sure. All right, so... One of the things I noticed when I broke down to to all this is one I'm going to record. I'm going to stop and I'm going to save this right here. And now the numbers for October 30th. Active this week are 21,285, up 264 from the week before. Our new listings are at 1,934, down 98. That 21,285 is a new record. Uh, cont contracts last week were 1,861, up 89. Our closings are at oh, 1,443, and coming soon to an MLS near you is 612 new listings. Our Crawford numbers show our supply at 84.8 and our demand at 76.7, giving us a 90.4.4 off of going into what we would call a buyer's market. Well, I'm not even sure how this one's going to turn out. Um, it's 4.15 right now. Um, after recording this episode three times i had to record it in little separate blocks i think i got it all together and it's 4 15 on halloween i gotta get home before the sun goes down and the monsters come out because i gotta get the house ready for the assault and so i'm gonna <clears throat> try to i'm gonna shut this down run home 
set up my laptop, start doing all the rest of the editing and this and that and the other thing as the monsters come to the door. And hopefully I could get something out before a decent time. All right. So uh, no cool segue or anything like that. I hope that you found this really educational and informational and whatnot. So um, watch your children and pets around water. All right. Don't drive into anything flooded. Or check your apples and your Halloween candy, even though I don't think that's actually a thing. They're just trying to scare you. All right. You guys have a great weekend. And hey, you know what? I forgot. I was gonna I was gonna cover something serious here. When we next talk to each other, okay, it's going to be after the election and we will know who won or who didn't win. Or more likely we're gonna be staring at a couple's states trying to figure out why they can't get their shit together and count votes on time all right you're going to be comparing our state to florida who's going to have all their stuff done that night they're saying georgia should get their stuff in they're still anticipating maricopa county is going to take for forever if your person has won congratulations if your person has lost i am sorry for you remember at the end of the day this is what we do one side wins, one side loses. So right now, on Thursday, October 31st, I want you to consider what happens if your team loses. So, um, I was going to add this thing on here, and I still might if I can find the clip, but I have an audio clip of October 31st right, in the year 2000. All right, one week before the 2000 election, and I was playing around with a little recording device, and I accidentally recorded this little segment of audio, and it was just basically the radio. And they're talking, you know, for certain people of a certain age, you re might remember the name Shonda Levy. All right, that's the kind of stuff that was going on before that election. All right, just a few days later, all right, we had the election, and next thing you know, it's three o'clock in the morning, and we have no idea who the president is because Florida is having a recount and one of the candidates had originally called and conceded the election and then called up and said, I'm taking back my concession. Right? And I think that the, that was the last sane week of my lifetime. And it's all been downhill since. All right. So here we are, October 31st, 2024. And then in the future, when we next talk to each other, it's going to be different. But let's remember who we are today. And how much we liked each other today. And let's try to like each other a week from now. All right? You guys have a really great weekend. I'll talk to you guys all later.